It's my real pleasure now to introduce Mette Sörensen uh, from Danish Cancer Institute. And Mette has been uh, given us the pleasure to hear about her research before, at a few times, actually. Uh, and uh, Mette has gained, I would like to say, almost worldwide recognition on her studies, uh, epidem epidemiological studies, uh, that has, <coughs> has uh, in a way followed in the footsteps of Wolfgang Babisch and uh, who uh, discovered these, uh, the cardiovascular connections between um, cardiovascular problems and noise. And uh, Mette has found even further uh, connections with other um, uh, impairments or like uh, stroke or uh, even di diabetes too. And it doesn't end there. She's going to tell us about two more fields where uh, she has a go got a lot of uh, things to present. <laughs> so Mette, there you go. Thank you. And uh, yes, it is true that most of my research has been on elderly, but we also have done some studies on children. And today I will present the study uh, entitled Exposure to Traffic Noise and Risk for Behavioral Problems in Seven-Year-Old Children, which was made uh, by one of my PhD students some years ago. It was published one year ago in the uh, in a European uh, Environmental Health Perspective. So. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, there has been some studies uh, suggesting that traffic noise may affect the child, uh, may increase the risk for child behavioral problems. Uh, I've listed some of the, s oops, some of the, no, this is not very strong, it's here. <laughs> uh, there's been a few studies. Uh, and most studies has focused on exposure to traffic noise at schools. Uh, but the, the question we want to answer is that uh, maybe a traffic noise at home is a more relevant source because we know that people, uh, that the children spend most time at home. Uh, and also, of course, they sleep at home and that may be important also. So only one study had looked on uh, traffic noise at home. That was a study by Tiesler in 2013. And in that study, they had almost 900 uh, children. Uh, they were 10 years of age. And they had information from this strength and difficulty questionnaire. I will come back to that later. And also um, uh, estimated exposure to road traffic noise at these children's home. And what they found was, in, I listed here the odds ratio here, 1.28 uh, uh, per interquartile range increase in this uh, traffic noise at home when they looked on this hyper hyperactivity and attention scale. I'll also come back to that later. Uh, just to say that there's this one study who actually suggests that the traffic noise at home may affect uh, child behavioral problems. Uh, also, we were not able to find any study who looked on pregnancy exposure uh, and we just heard uh, from Jenny that uh, pregnancy exposure may also be a relevant exposure window to look at. So how can traffic noise affect uh, the risk for having these behavioral problems in children? So we'll start with what we could call the usual suspect. We know that traffic noise stresses us. This was what Jenny already uh, went through. Uh, and also we know that uh, if you're exposed to traffic noise when you sleep, uh, this can have an impact uh, on your sleep quality, on the sleep quantity. And uh, if we then start to look at this, it could be the exposure to the mother uh, during pregnancy. It could uh, increase if the mother during pregnancy were uh, exposed to traffic noise. Uh, she could have increased level of cortisol, as Jenny again explained. And we know that cortisol can pass to the fetus. So again, this could affect the neurodevelopment. Also, if she slept, uh, had a reduced sleep uh, quality during uh, the pregnancy, this could also affect the neurodevelopment of the child. 
Then, of course, as when the child is born, you could also uh, imagine that this child could be uh, exposed to traffic noise, which could uh, both uh, during the day lead to stress and during the night affect the child's sleep, which could lead to annoyance, arousal, frustration, which could increase the risk for this child having uh, behavioral problems. So therefore, the aim in the study we did was to investigate the association between this residential road traffic uh, and in this study we also wanted to look at railway noise exposure and behavioral problems in seven-year-old children. And here we of course want to look at two different exposure windows, the pregnancy exposure and also the exposure during childhood. To investigate uh, this, we used a birth cohort we have in Denmark called the Danish National Birth Cohort. Uh, it uh, enrolled uh, mothers and child pairs in 1996 uh, to 2002, and a little more than 100 mothers, uh, mother child pairs, uh, was uh, included in this study. And uh, the mother were included when she was pregnant, around uh, 12 uh, weeks, uh, where she received an interview, a telephone interview, uh, and also later in the 13th pregnancy week. Uh, and there were, as it answered, a number of questions on smoking, alcohol, mental health, and a number of other questions. I think this question, uh, this interview took uh, 45 minutes, so it was a really long interview. Uh, these chi children have then been followed up later, uh, and the one that we use in this study is the seven-year follow-up questionnaire, which were mailed to the parents. So the parents were the one reporting this uh, questionnaire, and uh, one of the questions were the strengths and difficulty questionnaire, which I will come back to, uh, which we use to define our endpoint, these behavioral problems uh, in our study. A little more than uh, 60,000 of the 100,000 uh, mothers uh, participated. So for these uh, nearly 60,000 uh, mother-child pairs, we now of course want to estimate what is the exposure to traffic noise at their addresses. Uh, and as I said, we want to estimate both road traffic noise and railway noise to have two rather independent sources of noise. So we went to the Danish Central uh, Population Registry uh, to get the full address history for all these mothers from uh, the date at the conception until the date of this seven-year interview. And for each of these uh, addresses, these were geocoded, we had information on height floor, and uh, these are then the input variable for this noise model that we use, the called uh, based on the sort Nordic prediction method, the computer software is called sound plan, and into this, this is of course an important input variable, but other input variables to this exposure model is the old Danish building polygons, and if we talk about uh, road traffic noise, we have gathered information for all road lines in Denmark with more than 1,000 vehicles on the traffic composition on this road, that is how many heavy vehicles, how many light vehicles are on this road. Uh, also yearly average daily traffic information and traffic speed and you can see here how that, oh, this one doesn't actually work that well, but you can see here how that looks in sound plan. In blue you can see all the, uh, this is uh, the city in Denmark, and in blue you can see all the building polygons, and in red you can see all the road lines, and all these road lines have this information in the computer software. Uh, and then we can get an estimate of uh, noise, road traffic noise, at the most exposed facade of uh, each of uh, the addresses we have in our study. The same is done with the, the railway we have from Bane Denmark, which is a Danish railway company. We had information for each railway links on annual average daily train lengths, train types, travel speed, and also noise barriers along the railways. And because, especially for road traffic noise, we know that the uh, air pollution might be important to adjust for, we have also on each of these addresses uh, estimated uh, exposure to uh, air pollution. So this is to show you how the noise distributed in this uh, cohort study. You can see here, up here, you have uh, road traffic noise, and down here you have railway noise. And if we start by road traffic noise, you can see it goes from 40 decibels to uh, 85 decibels. This is during pregnancy, and this is during childhood, and they are rather similar. 
And uh, here we have railway noise. Uh, there we have only uh, 13 to 15 percent exposed to railway noise in Denmark. And it distributed from 20 decibels up to this a little more than 80 decibels. So I promise to get a little back to this uh, strength and difficult questionnaire, which is the questionnaire that the parents fill in uh, at around seven years of age of their child. And this is a screening tool uh, made by Goodman uh, that is uh, telling you something about the child behavior. And we use the Danish uh, version, uh, translation uh, version from 2003. And what it consists of is 25 uh, items, or you could also call it questions, but in this terminology they like to call it items. But 25 items that the uh, parents uh, answer about uh, uh, their child. And by using this uh, you can uh, uh, generate uh, these uh, four different uh, categories. Uh, you will get an uh, estimate of uh, emotional systems, uh, conduct problems, hyperactivity in attention, per relation problems and pro-social behavior. And these four are then summed up to uh, what you call a total difficulty scores. And uh, based on these scores, we, uh, d for each child, define uh, whether the child is in the category of normal, borderline or abnormal behavior. So we have these uh, nearly 60,000 uh, children to start with. We uh, excluded uh, 3,000, which uh, it were in this cohort with more than one pregnancy. So we excluded the second pregnancy to avoid that there were any dependency. Uh, we only included single sons, so we excluded all the twins. Uh, triplets. We excluded the uh, children where we didn't have noise data on and we excluded children where we don't have this strengths and difficulty questionnaire complete and we excluded children where we didn't have any confounders and we this made a data population on uh, 46,940 children. So briefly on the statistical analysis, uh, it was logistic regression. And what's important here is that the input uh, traffic noise uh, input that we use were, of course, uh, mean average uh, or average through the entire pregnancy. That was uh, one exposure window. And also from birth to seven years of age, we made a mean. How, how much was the child exposed to during this period? For railway noise, we used uh, the the exposure at the time the, the child was uh, answering the questionnaire. Uh, and then we calculated odds ratios for being borderline or normal uh, if we use this uh, abnormal as category. And we adjusted for a number of different uh, potential confounders such as uh, the sex, age, gestational age, birth weight, maternal age, at delivery, parity, smoking, alcohol consumption, educational level, disposable income and self-reported mental health problems. And this is the characteristic of our population. Here you have the total cohort on these uh, ne nearly 47,000 uh, children and here you have the borderline children and here you have the abnormal children. And what you can see is, this is percentage, you can see that the abnormal tend to be uh, more boys, they tend to be more the first born child, uh, they, their mother uh, smoked more during pregnancy uh, also, the mother were more likely to have had uh, mental problems during pregnancy. Uh, the also, the mother had a lower education compared to the total cohort and also a lower income. So, to the results. Uh, this is first the results for the pregnancy exposure, that is exposure to road traffic noise and to railway noise during pregnancy. And uh, we start with this total difficulty score, um, which is an overall estimation of the uh, behavioral problems in the child. So 
Uh, you can see here the crude estimates and here the adjusted estimate and this is for road traffic noise and the results are per 10 dB increase. And what you can see here is that we found absolutely no associations uh, for pregnancy exposure and that was the same for both road traffic noise and also for railway noise. So no association with pregnancy exposure. Also, we looked on these four different subscales, also with pregnancy and exposure, these emotional system, conduct problems, hyperactivity, relationship problems, and for we didn't see any tendencies, any associations for pregnancy exposure either. But then we, of course, all co of course also looked on this childhood exposure, that is the exposure from birth to seven years of age. Again, here we have road traffic noise, down here we have railway noise, and normal, borderline abnormal. And what you can see here is that uh, if we start, uh, if you look at these adjusted models, you can see that actually we found a statistically significant increase in this total difficulty scores, uh, such that every time road traffic noise went up by 10 decibel, the risk for having uh, uh, being abnormal on this scale was 7% uh, increased. And interesting, when we looked on railway noise here, we, for railway noise, we summed these two because we didn't have that many exposed. These are only, we only had around 6,000 per children that were exposed. You can see we actually found the same, a statistically significant uh, risk for being abnormal if we were exposed to railway noise. So again, we tried to look at these uh, four uh, subscales also, and uh, we could see that uh, especially uh, for this hyperactivity in attention scale, uh, we found uh, a statistically significant increase, and this was both in the borderline group and also in the abnormal group. And interesting, we f found the same uh, tendencies also for railway noise, and I think it's important because actually we find only very weak associations between road traffic noise and railway noise, so these are two relatively independent sources which seem to lead to the same result. Also, the subscale per relationship. Uh, we saw some tendencies of an increase. It wasn't statistically significant. It was for uh, railway noise, but not for road traffic noise. And the two other scales we didn't find any associations with. So, to conclude, uh, in our study we found that exposure to traffic noise at home during pregnancy uh, was not associated with behavioral problems in children when they reached seven, uh, but that uh, road traffic noise and uh, railway noise during childhood may be associated with these behavioral problems, especially uh, hyperactivity and uh, per relation problem. And just to say that uh, this, of course, uh, meant that we were interested in trying to maybe look a bit further into that. And uh, uh, Maria, who's also here today, and I have therefore started to do a study where we used a sub-cohort of this large 100,000 cohort uh, called the Lifestyle During Pregnancy Follow-Up Study, which has uh, 1,750 children. But for these children, they have uh, been in, talked to physicians, uh, psychologists, and we have detailed information on IQ, cognitive, behavioral, and emotional, and social function at the age of five for these children, and we also have information on sleep for these children. So we want to try to look uh, more into this, uh, but at children, uh, fewer children, but with much more detailed information. So, first of all, I'll just uh, like to acknowledge Doid, who was the one who actually did all the, the uh, all the data collection here and uh, the analysis and wrote the paper, and Anne-Marie Nybo Andersen, which is the one who are more or less responsible for making this large cohort. And uh, to uh, Creal in Barcelona, because I didn't, I don't know that much about these uh, scales, uh, so therefore I sent Dorit to Barcelona to learn how to actually use these scales. Uh, and also, of course, to the European Research Council, which funded the study. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much, Mette. Uh, it's really interesting to hear that you can actually put numbers on these 
suspicions that we have that children have difficulties due to traffic noise where they live. It's really nice you have numbers now and it is proved, isn't it? Yeah, I think we need a little more studies, so <laughs> but uh, it points in that direction. I yeah. agree. Yeah. So, um, questions? Now Franz is the one who's going to run around. Hello, I'm Minna Huotilainen from Helsinki and Uppsala. Thank you for this really interesting talk. Uh, do you have data on the attenuation factors of the houses? Because at least in Finland we have these house regulations and you should know how much of the traffic noise is actually there inside where the child is sleeping. We don't have this information. Actually, I recently uh, went to the Danish building registry to see if we could get any information, and I saw uh, talked to a number of acousticians about it. But they say that uh, we we need to have uh, specific information on which windows that is what uh, is relevant. Everything else doesn't really matter. It's a window, and it's a specific type of window, and we don't have this information. Uh, so you can change your windows, but if it's not a sound insulation window, it doesn't really help that much. So they say that based on registry data, it's almost impossible. And even if you ask people, I would say it more or less impossible because people don't know I the exact type of their windows. So. And another question, did you ask them about if they are bothered by the noise? We, we don't have this information, okay. but that's so. Yeah, we want to do more in this smaller group. We don't have information on whether they are bored, uh, but we know whether they are disturbed by sleep, and I think maybe that could be some kind at least of indicator of whether they are annoyed by this traffic or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shastin wants to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Very, very interesting. I was just thinking in the follow-up study, maybe then you could ask uh, if the, which bedroom the child is sleeping in, which if that that has a window facing the street or the railway. Yeah, but the, the problem is it's a follow-up study when they were five years old, so it's already conducted. So. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so we ju we get the information, but otherwise I agree. We are doing a cohort on uh, elderly now where we ask this question because I agree that this is really important information in doing these studies. Actually, I think that is a very relevant question because uh, in Sweden nowadays you know that um, the authorities want to allow more traffic noise. And uh, uh, due to the fact that we know that it's... Uh, it's good to have a quiet side in your apartment, if you have that, then it's uh, possible, okay, Anita uh, has uh, studied that. Uh, but it is interesting to see what do the family do? Do the parents take the quiet side and have this bedroom there, and where do they put the kids? I'm not sure that the kids get the quiet side, actually. <laughs> that would be interesting uh, to know. Uh, more questions on this? I have, of course, a methodological question. I was happy that you are going to do this uh, more in-depth study afterwards. There was a relationship with uh, being the first child and uh, having impairments. And I'm thinking about the mother reporting this. Uh, she might not have such a good reference when she's filling this in. I don't know. How, do you have any comment on that? Maybe she thinks her child is really a trouble all the time if she doesn't have a reference. Yeah, I, I don't know that much about the subject, but you could of course speculate that that could be the, the case also when you only have one child and maybe it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to find the time to actually go through this hard screening program. But it's just that they are the firstborn, so you could have uh, had a, a sibling uh, two, month, two years or something later. So it's not yeah. that they are only but with because these are filled in when they oh. are seven uh, mm. but uh, yeah I, I don't actually know uh, why uh, it, because it was actually really strong it was a high percentage yeah. much more higher percentage but I don't uh, know exactly why that is I think we have a question did you have one more question yes, yes. please Irene if I come 
should be on. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we looked into this on the ranch data around major airports, and we did find a weak association between the noise levels and um, hyperactivity on the strength and difficulty scale. So there's some some evidence already there, but I still wonder about the mechanism. I'm not sure if there's an immediate pathway, really. So we actually concluded that in children who have uh, uh, hereditary hyperactivity, it might be um, enhanced or deteriorate because of the noise, mm. but it's more like an indirect pathway. How do you see yeah, that? Yeah, I actually agree. It could be the thing that is actually tipping the child. So we have a child that is maybe uh, predisposed of this, and when they are exposed, this is what tips them to being abnormal. Uh, I agree that that seems... Also because we didn't see anything at all in this pregnancy exposure, so it's uh, it it would be something that the child experienced. So, so I think that's uh, because also there is this high genetic... Uh, uh, issue also, so so I agree that yeah, it could be the things that tips it. Mm -hmm. okay, 